Right, um, everyone's made it back from their three-day weekend in one piece. Uh, we have an ADM today, we have another ADM tomorrow, we will get through this in one piece. Okay, so um, Max here again. I believe there may be some changes to the Wi-Fi, hopefully it's worth this time, fingers crossed. Uh, so as with last time, we have an ADM and we Okay. We start a new topic today, and that's momentum. So presumably, everyone did their pre-lecture assignment. The image on the screen, most physicists will look at it and go like, oh, that's a nice demonstration of linear momentum in physics, which is the topic of the day. I look at it more like this, but that's believable. Okay, what is momentum? Um, momentum is a vector. It is defined as the product of the mass and velocity of an object. It's m times v. Um, so p, which is the symbol we use for momentum, it, I know there's no p in actual momentum, but p is momentum. Okay. Um, it's a vector quantity. It's the mass times the velocity. The units are the units of mass multiplied by the units of velocity, so it's kg meters per second. Uh, we haven't come up with a nice special name for this unit, so the unit is just kg meters per second. Um, so, when we're talking about the momentum of a single object, like an object of mass m moving with some velocity v, we typically put that in a lowercase. And if we're talking about the momentum of a system of objects, right, that means we're talking about a bunch of objects moving together. We are adding up all their momentum. We're talking about the total momentum of the system, and that's what we use to add. Okay, momentum is a vector, right? So pluses and minuses mean directions. So remember your coordinate systems. Pick a direction as positive. A velocity that's positive indicates it's moving in the positive direction. It will have a positive momentum, right? A positive momentum and a negative momentum are in opposite directions. It's a vector, so treat as a vector. Um, okay, the idea of momentum guys are familiar with, F equals MA, right, was actually stated in terms of momentum, right? when we can actually use the law, here in the topic of momentum, it's actually stated in the law in terms of momentum. And in terms of momentum, the second law, which is force of mass times acceleration, the net force, becomes, the net force is the rate of change of momentum. It is delta P over delta T. is the change in momentum of that object. So that's delta P, right? The important part of this law is not its math form, but it's what it's telling you. When go back to rates of change. When we hit rates of change in position, we're extremely position in its velocity. When rates of change in position, we're extremely position in its correct? So when we did rates of change, we said that if an object is moving with zero conservation law 
uh, that we are going to start studying this semester. So the first one was last week, right? Conservation of momentum. Okay? Another one is energy conservation law and conservation of momentum. Okay? Momentum, so essentially, like any conservation law, we can say that you know the initial momentum must equal the final momentum. Um, of course, unlike energy, there's a caveat. Right? Momentum is not always right? momentum is conserved when the external force acting on the system is zero. Everyone with me? Right? So the way we get around it is we define systems such that the external force acting on them is zero. Right? So the choice of system is up to you. So if I choose two objects and momentum is generally used in order uh, to deal with collisions. So if I have two objects, M1 and M2, which, if I can back this up, yeah, they hit each other, right? So I have two objects coming and hitting each other. They have multiple options. They can stick together and move off. They can bounce off of each other. There's a bunch of stuff that can happen, right? But, oops, yeah. But what we do know is that the initial momentum of the system is the momentum of the first guy, object one, plus the momentum of the second guy, object two. Right? The final momentum of the system is the final momentum of the first guy, plus the final momentum of the second guy. Does this make sense? So I'm defining my system as both these objects. Right? Then the only forces acting on these two objects that they collide are the forces they exert upon each other. There's nothing external to this. Everyone is so why I can see momentum. Right? That's why the, uh, the initial total momentum in the beginning must equal the initial total momentum at the end. Um, so I can say PI is equal to PF and solve for whatever I need to solve for. Right? So this would be what the equation comes out to be. We'll do the math in a little bit with actual numbers. OK, so defining the system is your first step to conserving momentum, right? And your first step will mean you select all the objects that you're interested in as the system such that there is no external force acting on that system. So if I have two objects colliding, right, it's generally best to include both of them in the system, right? The idea being that no force is external to this system, so momentum of the system is if, on the other hand, I picked just M1, right? its momentum is not M2 is a little more. Everyone will do this. Go back to the equal chain and the equal. Right? Um, if they're standing in the rest, right? they have zero momentum. I hope so. They don't have zero momentum anymore. Their momentum is obviously not Correct? But if my system is there and I move, then the total momentum of that system should be. And the way you reason that is the macro step, that means that way. So if there's no bridge on the two, and micro step that way, there's no bridge on the two. That makes sense? Right? So the initial momentum of the Before you can start conserving momentum. Okay, your first clicker question. Remember, momentum is mass times uh, velocity, and kinetic energy, which is the energy the greatest kinetic energy. As you're answering this, compute the momentum of these. What can you say about their momentum? All these objects. What is the their momentum? They all have the same momentum. Correct? The product of A and B with all of these is the same amount. Right? Does that mean you have the same kinetic energy? Happy. It's one half time Let's see where you guys are at. Good. I 
I probably shouldn't have said good. Um, but, okay, you get the idea. So um, I'm going to close out of this. What we find is that the smallest object, right, the one with the smallest mass, has the greatest kinetic energy if all of them have the same momentum, right, indicating that there must be some relationship between the momentum of a system and its kinetic energy. Everyone with me so far? Okay, let's actually look at that relationship. So we define momentum as m times v. We define kinetic energy as one half m v squared. Everyone with me so far? So let's multiply both sides of this equation by m. I get m times k is one half m v squared. Correct? So this term is p. So I can substitute mk is p squared over 2, or k is p squared over 2m. Now, I don't expect you guys or need you guys to remember the math definition, but look at that relation. What this is saying is that if two objects have the same momentum, so they're the same, correct? Then the one with the smaller mass has the higher energy. Right? And that is all we need. If two objects have the same momentum, right, the same value of momentum, the one that has the smaller mass will have more energy. Everyone with me? They do not mix up these two topics. Kinetic energy. back to this. I think I have another clicker one for you, and I do. So presumably you heard exactly what I just said and can tell me what it was. closed out the question. That's fine. Uh, let's see where you guys were at. The one with the larger mass will have the uh, will have a smaller kinetic energy, so A. Right, how do I close this? Click in if you haven't, and then I'll close. Right. Okay. Now, I'm actually not opening this question yet. Let's say I have a toy gun, which I'm pointing in that right? What is the total initial momentum of the gun plus bullet case? If I have a gun, which I don't, I'm um, pointing it in that direction, right? What is the total momentum of the gun plus bullet system? Is anything moving? No. So what is the total initial momentum? Zero, right? Okay. Say I fire the gun, has any external force acting on that system? No, right? The only force is a whatever kind of reaction going on inside the creation of the Correct? So those forces are internal to the system. Everyone with me so far? Right? So what should be the final momentum of the system? Zero, right? If the initial momentum of the system is zero, no external force is acting, then the final momentum of the system but in my final situation, right, I have to do that. Is that true? Right? And see, 
have the same momentum. Why is the bullet? Why is the bullet capable of harming, harming more? I'm going to keep my mouth shut. It's good, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut. That actually wasn't keeping my mouth shut. You're right. The bullet, which is significantly smaller than the gun, has more energy. So our ideas so far are that momentum can be conserved so long as that device is one which going to serve the goal that. Right? Kinetic energy of two objects having equal momentum, the object with lower mass has more kinetic energy. Now let's try an actual example. Let's say I have a person standing on a scale. So if they're initially just standing on a scale, what is the momentum? how we would write this out. So you have an initial system, which is the person on the skateboard. So this is the mass of the person. That's the mass of the skateboard. Nothing's moving, so PI is 0. Right? This PI is, of course, the initial momentum of the person plus the initial momentum of the skateboard. Right? So, subscript P is person, subscript F, uh, S is skateboard. Um, after it pushes off, the person is moving off in that direction. So, I have MP moving off with a speed in this direction of 0 0.6 meters per second. And I have the skateboard moving in that direction with some speed, which I do not know. I know the mass of the skateboard is 2.5 kgs. Everyone with me so far? Right? Now, the final momentum of this system is the momentum of this guy, which I'll call P final person, plus the momentum of the skateboard, which is uh, P final skateboard. Everyone with me so far? OK. Now, remember, it's a vector. Right? So that means I need a direction that's positive, and the opposite of that direction is negative. So let's just say I pick that way positive. Right? That means VP is positive. Right? And VS is negative. Everyone with me so far? So now we can write P final is mass of the person times speed of the person in that direction minus MS VS. Right? That minus sign is because Vs is opposite Vp. And that must equal the final momentum of the system, which must equal initial momentum of the system, therefore zero. Everyone with me? Right? Now solve for Vs, right? the velocity of the skateboard, which comes out to be... that much, right? And plug and chug the numbers, and you're all set. So the idea with momentum conservation is literally that we
Okay. So it is possible to find the speed. It is also, once you have the speed, possible to compute the kinetic energies, right? So without, uh, without actually computing it, your mass is 50 kg. Right? So the speed of the skateboard is 20 times as much, right? because the mass of the skateboard is 1 20th the mass of the person in this case. Right? <clears throat> Meanwhile, the kinetic energy is 20 times more than the kinetic energy of the person. Right? Okay. <clears throat> now, we come to discussing collisions. Right? So the idea is Other. There's two broad categories of collisions that can happen, two different types of collisions. First off is something we call an elastic collision. Typically, an elastic collision involves objects that are bouncing off of each other. A reasonably good approximation and a macroscopic collision, so a large scenario, is like um, two. Right? You have these hard spherical balls which are bouncing off of each other. And in general, when that process happens, not just in momentum, so, let's just think about that for a second. There is no such thing as a law of conservation of kinetic energy. Okay? There's a law of conservation of energy. Correct? As we discussed last week. It can transform into various types, etc., etc. What we're saying now is when two objects undergo a perfectly elastic collision, right? Then, not only is the momentum but the kinetic energy of the system is also good. The reason we call this elastic is we're dealing with essentially elastic forces. What we're assuming is that as these objects come together, right, let's say that there are springs bouncing off of each other. Right? So they have a certain velocity right, coming towards each other. There's a slight amount of compression. And then there's expansion. So whatever energy went into the compression is, is returned when it expands back, just like a spring. This makes sense? Right? So no energy is lost to other processes, like heat, sound, light, detonation. Everyone again. Right? Those kinds of collisions are called elastic collisions. Right? And elastic collisions are typically not collisions you observe in day to day life. Right? Most of the collisions you see, XYZ running into ABC, right? the most obvious collision. Those are not elastic. Kinetic energy is not conserved. Uh, most collisions that we don't see, at least at an atomic level, at a molecular level, you have molecules bouncing off of each other. They're literally like perfect spring systems. Right? When that happens, those collisions are mostly elastic. This makes sense. So in a large scale scenario, like our size scale, it's very rare to see an actual elastic collision. Right? But when we talk about molecular collisions, and then we get gases towards the end of the semester. Right? Our assumptions are that those collisions are elastic. Right? Because these molecules behave like springs. Right? Any compression is received back at kinetic energy when it leaves the Everyone will think, think of a ball bouncing, a basketball bouncing on the floor. Right? It compresses. And it reacts with it. Springs. Okay? Uh, so, in an elastic collision, we conserve both the momentum and the kinetic energy. Right? So the initial momentum of the system is equal to the final momentum of the system, and the initial kinetic energy of the system is equal to the final kinetic energy of the system. Right? Um, the second kind of broad category is an inelastic collision. Right? And again,
line back? The little guy and the big guy? Who run into each other? That is in the last situation. Right? The momentum of that system is to the good. The kinetic energy, not so much. There might be a certain amount of energy introduced in one of these characters, and that energy is not a problem. At least not a kinetic energy. Um, okay. So for inelastic collisions, the objects bounce off of each other, and there is possible deformation. Right? A classic case of inelastic collisions is when two objects stick together after colliding. Right? So if I throw something or two things run into each other and they stick and move off, that collision is perfectly inelastic. Um, so that So that's where they stick together, and again, momentum must be conserved. Let's see if you guys are still awake. Very good. Momentum is still conserved. So click something. Right, this was an elastic collision. Let's talk about the most repeating These two objects collided and stuck together. What must be true about the initial environment? Because I can define a collision as a system in which there is no external force. That makes sense? Okay. So regardless of what kind of collision it is, I can conserve momentum. Right? So momentum is conserved even in an inelastic collision. So, yes. Now, this is, let's say, a rocket right, that has been launched. And during its parabolic trajectory, right, the nice trajectory of a projectile that we spent at least for some time, study, right, during that nice parabolic trajectory, it explodes. Okay, it generally meant to explode by design, that goes as a section. Uh, what must be true? Is the momentum of that system, so you have this rocket that was launched, Right, it's flying in midair and it explodes into a bunch of pieces. Okay, uh, what must be true of the final momentum of all these pieces? Must they equal the total momentum of the initials? Was there any external force? There was no external force, right? The rocket explodes due to external forces. Correct? No external force, can I conserve momentum? Yes. Okay, so all of these objects will move in a trajectory such that the total momentum of the system is the same as it was before, right? The way to think about that is it's something like this is what the rocket was doing, so over there, let's say it explodes. 
something goes off that way, something goes off that way, something goes off that way, right? Such that these vectors, this guy and this guy, will still add to get the same initial momentum. This makes sense? Right? So if one goes above the rocket by a certain amount, the other one goes below the rocket by the same amount. Right? So that you're conserving momentum in this axis as well. Everyone with me? So, as the point still is, as long as you can identify a system where there's no external force acting on it, you can conserve momentum for that system. Okay. Um, click something. Yes, good. Says initially at rest. Correct? So the initial velocity of both objects is zero, meaning the initial momentum of both objects is zero. So the initial momentum of this system is zero. This makes sense? Okay. Um, click. Now, let's think about this one for a quick second. Before we argue, it's important. Uh, what we're saying is that a system of particles is known to have total momentum. Okay? Does this necessarily imply that the kinetic energy of that system is zero? Yes. 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 Go back to the garden as full of Right? Initially, zero momentum. I fire this thing, the gun recoils that way, the bullet goes that way. The final momentum is still zero, but stuff is moving. The kinetic energy is a scale, momentum is a vector. Right? Momentum can be zero as long as it is equal and opposite. Right? Kinetic energy doesn't matter. I have an object moving that way with some kinetic energy, I have an object moving that way with some kinetic energy, there's no kinetic energy, this is about this. There's no plus in the mind. does not imply that there is no motion in that system. Right? That there is no energy due to motion in that system. So what we're saying is, if I have two objects, m moving with velocity v in this direction, m moving with velocity v in that direction, right? equal masses, equal speeds in opposite directions, the total momentum of this system is zero. Correct? But the kinetic energy is one half mv squared plus one half mv squared. Right? There is still energy in this system. This makes sense? What if I said the same question the other way around? The kinetic energy of a system is known to be zero. What must be the total momentum? Is the momentum necessarily zero? Yes, because if the kinetic energy is zero, everything is at rest. That's the only way kinetic energy can be Everything is at rest. Right? Everything is at rest, then yes, momentum is zero. But the converse is not true. Zero momentum does not imply zero taking position. Right? Zero taking position is just the kinetic energy of the system. Right? Does this make sense? Um, let's keep going. Right, so I'm presuming you guys had enough time to click something. And you click the right thing, so we can move on. Good. Okay, now we have a problem that you guys are going to solve. So set up this problem. 
you have Goni and Mario, right? Uh, Mario is Goni is. Right? My first setup should be the initial momentum of the system. Right? The system, of course, is Gordy plus Mario, right? both colliding objects. So, right. this is Gordy. So, mass of Gordy is 100 kgs. He's moving this way with the speed Vg is 5 meters per second. And this is Mario. Mass of Mario is 80 kgs. And Mario's initial speed is zero. Right? He's at rest. So that's my initial system. Everyone is thinking. So before we apply conservation of momentum, we need to find how much momentum is in the Start with moving in the game. Right? So the initial momentum is not zero. So, P initial is P initial Mario plus P initial Gordy. This is zero. This is mass of Gordy times his initial speed. Let's say this direction is positive. Right? So, this becomes 100 times 5, that is 500 kg meters per second. So, that is my initial momentum of So now we go to what happens after the collision. So after the collision, Gordy hits Mario. Um, Mario goes flying in that direction with a speed of 3.75 meters per second. Right? The question is asking me what is Gordy's final speed? Right? Actually asking me what is the final speed. Right? So not only the magnitude, but in what direction? So let's find the final momentum of this system. So my final system looks something like this is Gordy. I do not know Vg prime, which is Gordy's final velocity. I do know Mario is moving in the direction I've called positive with the speed of 3.75 meters per second. Right? And mass of Mario is still the same. Everyone with me so far? So my final momentum is the final momentum of Gordy plus the final momentum of Mario. Better? Okay. Final momentum of Gordy is mass of Gordy times Vg prime, which I do not know. I do not know Gordy's final velocity. Right? Uh, plus mass of Mario times Vm prime, right, which is 3.75. This must equal P final. Everyone with me so far? Well, since I'm applying momentum on a day, I need to know the momentum we should of the system to get the total initial total time. Right? And then I can be the total initial total time. Everyone with me? So now this becomes P final must equal P initial, right, from conservation of momentum. So this guy, Mg is 100, Vg is unknown. This is 80 times 3.75 must equal that much, right? It must equal that guy, my initial momentum of the system. So this is equal to 500. I have one equation and one unknown, so I'm pretty sure you guys can solve it. So if I end up with a positive 
okay. The same thing can be applied to a coordinate from two and then they stick together. Right? This is an example of law in any elastic right? If two objects collide and stuck together. The same logic implies you find the initial momentum of the system by adding the momentum of the truck to the momentum of the car. They're in opposite directions from one to the other. Right? So you weigh that to the total momentum of the car plus the truck system and so on. Okay, so when momentum isn't conserved, so obviously if momentum is not conserved when you have an external force acting on the system, right? This brings us to something called the impulse momentum theory. Um, an impulse is literally a force acting for a big amount of time. It's literally a push-shove, right? If you want something to touch you, land it back. times the amount of time it acts for, and that results in a delta P, a change in momentum, right? So since F external is delta P over delta T, F external times delta T is delta P. That's all this is saying. Right? So what an impulse does, right? so when you have a force acting on a system for a really long time, right? you're giving that system to impulse. What an impulse is doing is it's changing the momentum. Um, <clears throat> so, it's very similar to work in energy, right? So you have a total energy in the system, you can add or subtract energy from that system by doing the difference. Right? Similarly, if you have a mental system, you can add or remove energy from that system by getting in the difference. Right? Like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so the idea of impulse is used in a lot of places. You have impulse from uh, car crash test dummies. So you have a force of the collision acting for a certain amount of time energy. Right? That's the total impulse given to the system, which is measured by energy. With a change in momentum. Right? Okay. So I know the drivers uh, of the crash test dummies, hence mass. If I know the amount of time of the collision, I can calculate the amount of force that is actually acting on that dummy during it. Okay. So that's it, right? The same thing is true of like hitting a tennis ball with a tennis racket or a racket ball with a racket ball racket. Use the right racket. Anyway, the point is you're using uh, you're, you're applying a force for a big amount of time to change the momentum of the system. Right? So over there, the tennis ball gives the system to apply a force using a racket for a small amount of time, S L T. That results in a delta T. Everyone with me? Okay. So impulse changes momentum. Okay. So far, and I'm going to stop after this topic. So far, our story has centered on taking all objects at point of mass. Right? Regardless of whether it's a big indicator or a little indicator, we think of them as their point of mass. Right? And they're describing their motion um, as a function. Correct? Real objects are not point of mass. Right? They're rigid objects. Right? So let's start by studying rigid objects. So a rigid object But a rigid object uh, is not easily deformed. And for a rigid object, we can define something called its center of mass. 
The center of mass is something you are intuitively familiar with. It is the point that moves as if the entire mass of the object were concentrated at that time. So, so far, what we've been talking about is the center of mass of all these objects. Because we've been treating all these objects as points. Does this make sense? The points can move from point to point and they can go around in a circle. But there is something a point cannot do. A point, for example, cannot go to this. A point has no dimension. It's physically For most uniform objects, is at the center of the object, right? Um, there doesn't actually have to be mass at the center of mass. A good example is a donut, right? A donut is a nice uniform object. Its center of mass is right in the middle. Is there any mass in the middle of the donut? Not really. Okay. Um, so, center of mass is just, for a uniform object, the center of the object. For a non-uniform object, and by a non-uniform object we mean an object whose mass distribution is not uniform, right? Um, the center of mass is found by taking what you call a weighted average. Right? So more mass implies more weight to that mass. Okay? You know this intuitively, as in if I were to ask you, is the center of mass of a hammer right in the middle of the that's you taking a weighted average in your way. Right? Um, so, I'm guessing some people can hold a bowl of soup like that. I can't. But the idea is to locate the center of mass and put your hand onto it. Right? If you did it, you'd get what we call a force, and it would fall. It would rotate. Does that make sense? much harder than it looks to be if the ball is significantly heavy. Okay, now here's the thing with that. Everything we have studied so far applies to the motion of the center of mass. Okay, so all the translational motion, this by the way is a, is a picture of a dancer. Okay? They're doing what we call a nice thing. That was a lot better, right? Yeah. And both of them, they were able to still be fresh. Oh. Hello. Um, it stopped working for me. So I just wanted to do my email. me? Why did it stop working? I don't know. I called you. Oh. Yeah, because you've got an answer. Teresa.